Do you know that 100 companies are responsible for 70% of CO2 emissions meme? Yeah, my dad used to work for like 4 of those companies for most of his life. Those 100 companies are all fossil fuel companies and he's a geologist, so it was his job to look for oil. According to him, he was really good at finding oil, the best even. But then again, he told me my grandfather could turn invisible, so you know, he might not be the most truthful person out there. Still, apparently he was pretty good at his job since he got to keep it through recessions and depressions. He's retired now, spending most of his days messing around with his bikes. But when he worked for those oil companies, his job involved reading seismographic data and finding the most likely places for oil. I still remember him telling me how it all works. Essentially, they use explosives to quote-unquote hear the underground layers of rock. So let's say you want to map the underground layer composition of a patch of land. Here's what you do. First, you put an explosive somewhere on that land. When you detonate it, it creates a sound wave which travels through the layers of rocks. Now, each layer reflects back the wave in slightly different manners and with slightly different timings. So if you have sensors on the ground listening for those waves at different distances from the explosion, you can map those layers of rocks and find out where things are. My dad's job was to look at those maps and classify those layers of rocks. And this is where big tech companies come in. Obviously, my dad used his eyes to classify those layers. That is to say, his job was essentially a computer vision problem. You can, in theory, use past seismographic data to train AI system to classify those layers automatically, and thus reduce costs and accelerate oil production. I don't know how fast my dad could do his job, but I'm willing to bet an AI would be at least a thousand times faster since my dad is a human being, as I check at least, and human beings need to sleep and whatnot. And so, big tech companies are rushing to develop these AI systems capable of streamlining oil exploration. Google, Amazon, and Microsoft are all at the forefront of this new business opportunity, the latest being a collaboration between Chevron, Schlumberger, and Microsoft. Now, considering the existential threat of climate change, why in God's name are they doing this? Most of these tech companies sell they'll go green, whatever the hell that means. So why are they still partnering with the industry that is negating their efforts? Well, money is green no matter where it comes from. I mean, out of the 10 largest companies by revenue, a full 6 of them are oil companies. So it makes sense why big tech companies are trying to cater to them. After all, this tech company's primary directive is to make as much profit as possible, and there's a gigantic demand for AI right now which they can provide. The partnership between tech and oil companies really started with cloud computing. Drilling for oil generates a buttload of data, with which oil companies need servers to store them. Before, oil companies have their own data centers and server farms, but that shit is expensive as hell. On top of that, processing those data into useful and actionable information requires a lot of computational time, but only in short bursts, which means there's a lot of idle time when the servers are just sitting there consuming electricity. So it makes economic sense for oil companies to just send their data to the cloud and rent computing power. On top of on top of that, tech companies also offer tools to analyze the vast amounts of data generated by oil explorations. I mean, the data from a single seismic survey can be as big as 1 million gigabytes, and tech companies have had the experience of handling such a ginormous amount of data. It's a match made in heaven, or hell if you're not rich and would like to live on Earth in the next 50 years. So if you boil it down, it comes down to money, just like literally everything else a company does. Oil companies would very much like to increase their production and cut costs, and tech companies would very much like to help them achieve that, but for a fee of course. At around 35 billion barrels per year, global oil production is currently close to an all-time high, but that's not enough for capitalism. If they were to survive, oil companies will have to keep on growing and growing, and since we're at the precipice of the age of AI, tech companies will be the gatekeeper to the next round of profitability growth. And if oil companies want to stay competitive, they would need to utilize all the tools offered by the tech sector, which means they're willing to spend a lot of money. Alright, so the mystery as to why tech companies are willing to work with oil companies is solved, right? Well, sort of. I mean, money is a pretty good answer, but like, that can't be all there is to it, you know? I mean, Google was willing to not cater to Chinese censorship and forgo a gigantic market in China, and they also dropped a project it was working on with the Pentagon. Both of these projects were dropped due to protests from Google's own employees, and they're now also protesting Google's relationship with oil companies. So it's kind of weird that Google's top brass is willing to drop those projects, but not their partnership with oil companies. This is why profitability cannot be the sole factor of why tech companies are working with big oil. I think there's something deeper going on, like an underlying belief or ideology held by the executives that allows them to justify the partnership. Alright, let's talk about Moore's Law for a second. If you didn't know, Moore's Law refers to the perception that the number of transistors in a chip doubles every two years. So far, it's more of a heuristic than an actual law, and it has been slowing in recent years. Nonetheless, that exponential increase in the number of transistors has created an expectation of ever-continuing technological progress. 
I mean, most people just sort of assume that progress will continue forever. The world's economy depends on it even. Think about how iPhones need to come out every year with better and better specs. Or Playstations, or Xboxes, or Nintendos, or TVs, or tablets, or cars, or whatever. All with better graphics, better cameras, better polygons, better pixels, better AI, better speed, better clock rate, better memory, better materials, better ways to suck your money and time. It's very much embedded in the world's culture. Not just in developed countries either, but also the rest of the world. And here's the thing, if the belief in technological progress is strong within the general population, imagine how much stronger that belief would be if your livelihood depends on that progress. And on top of creating the perception of indefinite technological progress, these advances have also created the perception that it can be applied generally to everything else. To quote Vaclav Smil, the world's foremost energy expert, these advances have led to the unintended effect of raising general expectations regarding the pace of technical progress. Rapid progress is now assumed to improve everything, from the energy density of batteries to 3D printing of living organs in short periods of time. These advances have also raised unrealistic expectations about the general progress of dematerialization. Thanks to Moore's law, that trend has been quite impressive as far as computation is concerned, with the mass of per unit RAM ratio having been cut by 9 orders of magnitude since 1981. But this example is also quite exceptional, as trends from the e-world are not readily copied in the world of mass material demands. There has not been, because there cannot be, any Moore's law-like progression in building essential infrastructures, expanding megacities, and manufacturing vehicles, airplanes, or household appliances, where even reductions of an order of magnitude, that is, maintaining the performance with only a tenth of the original mass, are uncommon. This expectation of indefinite and generalizable progress is why I think tech executives are able to rationalize their decisions to work with oil companies. Essentially, they're all techno-optimists and believe that more slow-like exponential growth can materialize outside of the tech sector through technology, even when it's physically impossible. Dematerialization is the key term here, which refers to the reduction of material and energy usage in an economy while still growing the overall size of the economy itself. And if you work primarily in the tech sector, dematerialization might be fairly obvious to you since more powerful computers have been made and are capable of operating with less and less materials and energy. But if you start to apply the same general principle to everything else, it will lead you to think we can extract as much oil as we want and somehow be safe since technology will save us in the future. I mean, they're extending that principle to decarbonization, creating a new principle similar to Moore's law called the carbon law. This new quote-unquote law posits that, like transistors, CO2 emissions will go down by half every decade or so. They argue we'll achieve that with stuff like carbon pricing, renewables R&D, and energy efficiency. Now, obviously, as a sensible person living in the 21st century facing climate catastrophe, I'm not against any of those practices by themselves. But, and it's a big but and I cannot lie, relying on just those policies while still letting capitalism run rampant won't solve climate change. Actually, it's going to make it worse. Here's what I mean. Google has been trying to go all renewable since at least 2012. Now, if you look at this graph, you might think that Google was using 100% renewables in 2018, but you'd be wrong. The number, if I'm reading this correctly, is actually exactly 50%, since the graph is showing you how much Google matched their energy spending with renewables, not how much electricity came from renewables. So, let's say, if they spent $100 in energy bill in 2019, matching 100% in renewables in this case means that they spent another $100 in renewable energy, bringing their total energy bill to $200. And you know what? That's fine. It's pretty good that Google is at least trying to go renewable. But you see how this is a marketing strategy to make Google look better than they really are, right? And have you noticed another problem? In 2012, they used between 3 to 4 terawatt hours of regular non-renewable electricity, and they purchased between 1 to 2 terawatt hours of renewables. But in 2018, they used about 10 terawatt hours, all of which came from non-renewables, and they matched it with another 10 terawatt hours of renewables. Now, unless CO2 emissions from non-renewable decrease by 65% between 2012 and 2018, which is highly unlikely, it is guaranteed that Google's CO2 emissions rose between those years. But due to carbon offsetting in the form of buying renewables, they can say their emissions are actually going down. Again, it's better than nothing, but buying carbon offset is, let's just say not everybody agrees whether it's good or bad for fighting climate change. So going back, even if they're able to make their servers and data centers more efficient, their CO2 emission is still rising. Increasing efficiency doesn't and has rarely result in decreasing material and energy consumption. Matter of fact, it's the other way around. Efficiency increases have led to increasing material and energy usage throughout history. This is called Jevons Paradox. To quote the definition from Wikipedia, Jevons Paradox occurs when technological progress or government policy increases the efficiency with which a resource is used, reducing the amount necessary for any use, but the rate of consumption of that resource rises due to increasing demand. The Jevons paradox is perhaps the most widely known paradox in environmental economics. However, governments and environmentalists generally assume that efficiency gains will lower resource consumption, ignoring the possibility of the paradox arising. 
Now, Jevons' paradox is actually not that simple. There are a lot of caveats and trends, and looking at energy usage statistics of certain regions without any context might make it seem like we're moving past it. But it's way more complicated than that. Go read Andreas Mom's Fossil Capital and Vaclav Smil's Growth if you want to know more. Or just wait until I make a video on it. Maybe the next one, we'll see. Anyways, generally speaking though, it has been through throughout history. What all of this means, essentially, is that increasing efficiency by itself is not enough to curb CO2 emissions. Worse, renewables don't generally replace fossil fuels. Instead, renewables become supplementary to fossil fuels. I mean, for the period from 1960 to 2009, globally, 1 kilowatt hour of non-fossil electricity replaced an average of 0.1 kilowatt hour of fossil electricity. This means renewables only replace about 10% of electricity generated by fossil fuels. So CO2 emissions just keep on growing, even as renewables' share of electricity generation rises. At a time when CO2 emissions have to go down quickly, not just stay constant, this is not good enough. On top of all of that, techno-optimists argue we can just deploy carbon capture technology to reverse climate change, as if all we need to do is just flip a switch and everything will be fine. The problem is that there's no viable way to deploy carbon capture that won't disrupt everything else. I've actually talked about this in my very first video, so check that out if you want to learn more. But again, the conclusion I came to is that carbon capture is not viable within our current capitalist system. And yet, a lot of people see this unproven technology as the key to solving climate change precisely because it's a technological solution, and as such, would make socioeconomic restructuring unnecessary. On the other hand, if you ignore what I've been saying in the past few minutes or so, then it would make it so much easier to justify the continuing usage of fossil fuels, since, hey, efficiency is going up, we're using more and more renewables, it's possible to suck CO2 out of thin air using carbon capture, and if all else fails, we can just geoengineer the Earth. Without more context surrounding those things, it's really easy to just say, well, technology is getting better, and therefore technology will stop climate change. And I believe this is pretty much the underlying principle of tech executives. I mean, I can't know for sure since I'm not a tech executive, but I am a and before this whole leftism thing, this is pretty much what I believed. Now, stuff like carbon quote-unquote law makes sense, right? If you extend the technological progression of computers to everything else, then it's really not hard to see why techno-optimists can be so, well, optimistic about technology. Whether it has any bearing on reality is another question. That, and plus, being a techno-optimist can make you a buttload of money, so that helps too. And the truth is, our whole socioeconomic structure is shaped around fossil fuels, and this belief is really effective at justifying the continuation of said structure. I mean, with its veneer of endless possibility, techno-optimism contains within it a kernel of hope, which is something we really do need. But the problem is that it's masking much larger problems like vast inequalities and environmental degradation, with which technology has made worse. Now, if you get this far, you might be wondering if I'm some sort of Luddite or primitivist or something like that. I can assure you, I'm not, obviously. I'm all for technology, science, innovation, and all that jazz, but only when they're being used to serve people, not profit. It should augment our connection with nature, not destroy it. It should allow us to come together, not grind our very psyche into dust and atomize society. The problem with technology, and by extension tech companies, is that it's accelerating the problems of capitalism, but people within it swear up and down it's making capitalism less shit. I mean, the incredible economic growth we have seen in the past 50 years are largely due to technology. And conversely, that growth has accelerated environmental degradation. The three are closely linked together. So, if you want to solve climate change, I think it's very important for us to realize and come to terms with this. Capitalism cannot fix this, and technology alone will not save us. Fossil fuels are the backbone of the capitalist system, and taking that out will necessitate more than just inventing some new technology. It will necessitate a complete restructuring of the current socioeconomic order and so on and so on.